now we are going to look at um, sort of build up to looking at the Cauchy-Schwarz Cauchy theorem for integrals. Um, and you might have seen the Cauchy-Schwarz theorem uh, or Cauchy-Schwarz lemma. Uh, you may have heard either one, um, which states that um, the what is it? The sum of ai times bi squared is less than or equal to the sum of ai squared times the sum of bi squared, right? And this is true for any real numbers, ai and bi. Um, you may have also seen this phrased in terms of um, dot product and length of vectors. But what we're going to do now is um, generalize this to integrals. So the first thing we have to prove is that um, if f and g are Riemann integrable, then the integral of f of x, g of x, f of x times g of x, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't. Then, what I want to say, then f times g is Riemann integrable. Okay? So for the proof, we are going to um, start with um, Suppose f and g are non-negative on our interval a, b. Okay, so this is going to be our assumption. We are going to deal with this assumption later, um, but we're going to prove it in this case and then deal with the um, deal with the general case later. Now choose a partition P and a sub interval XK minus one to XK of our partition P. Um, so we know since, since f and g are um, since the functions right we're assuming they are Riemann integral um, they they're also bounded right and we've used this idea before um, in in sort of the upper and lower sums and the, which are of course important for the Darbo criterion. So uh, what this tells us is that, um, so let M sub F, M sub G be the um, soup values of F and G on um, on this xk minus 1 xk interval. Then, since these are non-negative values, we know that f of x times g of x is less than or equal to m, capital M sub f times capital M sub g, right? Because um, if you have two non-negative values, um, you can multiply them preserving order. Thus, um, the set of values of f of x times g of x, where x is in xk minus 1 to xk, um, Really, I should say that um, 
what should I say here? So as a first observation, I just want to say that um, so f of x is always less than or equal to the supernorm of f, and um, similarly g of x is always less than or equal to the supernorm of g. And so, um, so this product of sup values is an upper bound for um, the, I guess, fg of ab. So thus, fg is bounded and um, well, we don't need the value of um, fg sub, but the um, so so this uh, knowing that fg is bounded allows us to construct these um, capital M and little m values for fg. Um, so now let so with M F G equal to the supremum of F G on this interval and with F of X G of X being less than or equal to M F times M G on this interval. So we have that mf times mg is an upper bound for the values of f of, uh, of fg on this interval. So therefore, mfg is less than or equal to mf times mg. Why? Because this is an upper bound, and this is the least upper bound. So the least upper bound is always less than or equal to any upper bound. Similarly, uh, similarly, if um, you can define little the little mf, little little mg, and little mfg, um, you can define those, and you will get that little mfg is less uh, is greater than or equal to right. So it's an opposite sign here. Mf times mg. Okay, um, so now we can put this information together. So thus, we are going to look at capital M sub FG minus little m sub FG. This is equal to, uh, sorry, not equal to, less than or equal to capital M sub F, capital M sub G, minus little m sub F, uh, times little m sub G. Now this is equal to, if I add and subtract the term um, capital M sub G, little m sub F, I can uh, rewrite this as capital M sub F minus little m sub F times capital M sub G plus capital M sub G minus M sub G little m sub F. So what happened here, um, these two terms were already here, and these two terms um, are opposites of each other. So we've added and subtracted this in the middle, and then that allows us to factor like this. Now, um, these values, capital M sub G and little m sub F, um, correspond to um, minimums and maximums of, or roughly speaking, supremums and infimums more formally, but minimums and maximums of values of G and F on, um, on a particular sub-interval. 
these must be less than or equal to the overall supremum values of these functions over all of a, b, right? Otherwise, we would have a um, contradiction. So, so this allows us to write like this. And the reason why we do this is because these two things are just numbers which don't depend on our partition. Okay? Everything else, though, these capital M's and lowercase m's, these depend on our partition. But now, now, summing this inequality, over every so so this inequality we now have is an inequality expressed over some sub interval of our partition so we have like n of these inequalities and so we're going to add them all up what we get on the left hand side oh and we're going to multiply both sides by dx i or delta x i but what we get here this capital M minus little m is an upper minus a lower, right? So what we're going to get on the left-hand side is that the upper sum for f of g minus, um, or f times g minus the lower sum of f g is less than or equal to this first term, capital M sub f minus little m sub f, that corresponds to a... Um, Sorry, an upper sum for f minus a lower sum for f times some fixed constant. And then this term corresponds to an upper sum for g and a lower sum for g times a fixed constant. Now, since f and g are... Uh, Riemann integral, we know by Darbo cr criterion that we can make these terms as small as we want, right? So these terms are going to zero. These terms are fixed and bounded. So this is fixed. This is fixed. So therefore, this whole right hand side is approaching zero as um, as our mesh I should mention goes to zero thus f times g is Riemann integral okay now of course we're not done because we started with this assumption that f and g were non-negative on our interval. Um, if f and g are not necessarily um, probably spelled that wrong. I honestly couldn't tell you. Are not necessarily non-negative. Um, well, we know they are bounded. They're bounded from above and below, but particularly they are bounded below. So there is some uh, k greater than zero, um, such that f of x plus k is greater than or equal to zero, and g of x plus k is greater than or equal to zero. Um, since the constant function 
k is um, in R of a b, right? We've actually we proved that a constant function is in R of a b. Um, then, um, then we know that f plus k and g plus k are also in the are also Riemann integrable by uh, vector space properties. Right? If I take f, f is Riemann integrable, k is Riemann integrable, if I add them together I get a Riemann integrable function. Thus, since f plus k and g plus k are non-negative functions, we know that f plus k times g plus k is Riemann integrable. Um, but then f plus k times g plus k minus kf, okay. Now kf is Riemann integral again by vector space properties um, because k is just a constant. So we can consider this as scaling up a function by a constant. So really we're treating k as both a function and as a scalar um, of our vector space, which, which is kind of cool um, that, that we can do that. Okay, And then k squared, of course, is another constant. So each of these four things is Riemann integral. So this total thing must be Riemann integral by vector space properties. But if you expand this out, then you get that this is equal to fg. Okay, so I know this was a lot of um, a lot of work to show that f of x times g of x is Riemann integrable, but um, you know that's how it is sometimes. So now we can get to the Cauchy-Schwarz lemma, the theorem, however you want to put it which states that the Riemann integral of f of x times g of x, if I take that integral value and I square it, it's less than or equal to the product of the Riemann integral of f squared of x dx times the integral of g squared of x dx. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this term B, this term A, and this term C. And we're going to see why I, I choose this later. So the proof isn't too bad. It uses a common idea that you may have seen before in the proof of other forms of co the Cauchy-Schwarz lemma. And that is to say we're going to let P be a polynomial, well, it, right now it's just a function in terms of t, um, which is equal to the integral from a to b of, um, let's see, t f of x plus g of x squared dx. So first we have to assert that this function is actually Riemann integral. Um, here, so we know we're starting, of course, with f and g being Riemann integral. Okay. And this, from this, right, we know that the product of f and g is Riemann integral. We know that the product of f with itself is Riemann integral. We know that the product of g with itself is Riemann integral. So here we have a linear combination of Riemann integral functions. So that's linear, uh, that's Riemann integral. And then you have a product of two Riemann integral functions, which is also Riemann integral. So this, this works out. We can, we can say that uh, this integral exists. And um, furthermore, since we are squaring a real valued function, this is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, because the interior is greater than or equal to zero.
So this function, p of t, is greater than or equal to 0 for all of t. But now we can uh, expand this square and actually um, sort of expand out this, this integral, right? We're going to get t squared times the integral. Remember that we can pull constants out of integrals. So that's what we're going to do here times the integral of f squared of x dx plus 2t times the integral of f of x g of x dx plus the integral from a to b of g squared of x dx. And so here I've just expanded p of t, and it's still greater than or equal to 0. Okay. But here, um, we can use what we've written up here. This term, the integral of f squared is a. So this is a times t squared. This here, the integral of fg, that's um, b. Oh, so I should mention I wanted this to be like b squared. Um, but this integral of fg, that's what I'm calling b. So we have 2 b t plus c. And this is greater than or equal to 0. So we can see that once we've, so we defined p of t like this, and then we expanded it out. And we can see that um, t, this is, a fun, uh, this is a quadratic function in terms of t, right? Because so a, b, c are constants which don't, don't rely on t. And the only way for a, um, a quadratic function, a parabola, to be greater than or equal to zero is for the, um, right, if we look at the quadratic formula, right, that means that the interior of the discriminant, right, um, or I guess this is just called the discriminant, um, but the interior of the square root has to be um, non-positive, right? If it were positive, then you would have two roots, and therefore you would have some space in between those two roots where you have um, negative, or, or possibly if it was facing downwards, then you would have everywhere would be negative. But the main thing here is that, um, therefore, b squared minus 4ac is less than or equal to zero. Now, Little b here, this is for a quadratic function which looks like this. Um, and so little b is equal to capital uh, 2 times capital B. So we have 2 times capital B squared minus 4. Little a is the same as capital A, and little c is the same as capital C. This must be less than or equal to 0. And so we get moving the 4ac to the other side. We get that 4b squared is less than or equal to 4ac, and therefore b squared is less than or equal to ac, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay. So the proof here, um, if if you haven't seen um, if you haven't seen the Cauchy-Schwarz theorem before, you might think this is like a really weird proof, right? Um, this is like a common way to prove it. There are many other ways to prove it. Um, but this is sort of a nice one because it uses this like idea of quadratic equations that you've probably seen before. Um, but yeah, so that's going to be it for um, the sort of integration section. Um, now we can get into... Uh, the, the next thing I'm going to cover is, um, uh, so I guess I'll say next will be the derivative, and um, of course theorems related to that, so the mean value theorem, um, I'm trying to think what else, and then that'll probably be it. I could get into... Um, power series, but I think I might just return to that at a later date because I feel like the analysis bit is getting drawn on a long time. So um, yeah, that's it for now.